Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. From the last talk, still excited about some of the sessions we just had. Um, but for the current talk, which you've all come to hear, as opposed to hearing the history of the last talk, um, we have uh, Dan Clancy here. I, I, I've known Dan for, for, I guess, many years now. I, I, I ran into Dan first when I gave a talk, I think, in 1995 at UT Austin, and, and he was uh, um, uh, studying with Ben Kuypers as a PhD student uh, on, on qualitative reasoning and did some really interesting doctoral work in that area. But uh, fo following uh, uh, his work uh, at um, at UT Austin, uh, Dan went off to, to NASA Ames, where he uh, um, eventually became the the, uh, uh, the director of the whole information sciences directorate there at Ames. And Ames is kind of the center for intelligent systems and AI research, among other kinds of um, applications of uh, computation. Um, and uh, I guess these days, it says here in the bio, I, was looking, I haven't talked about this yet, Dan, but you recently asked to lead the NASA AIMS response to the new vision for exploration. So I guess you've left the directorate now and are working on a special project. Yes, I, I don't like to say one job more than you are. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll turn uh, over the talk to Dan now about, about uh, enabling NASA's new vision for space exploration through human-centered intelligent systems. Thank you, Art. So um, I actually... Um, have like four different talks in here, and I have far too many charts than I could ever present, which is perfect. And I actually uh, changed it last night. Initially, I kept going back and forth between talking about a few things, getting into some technical depth, we're talking about a bunch of things, and never ever getting to where you know you'd want to be. But there were so many things that I wanted to include, so I opted kind of a broad coverage. So what I'm going to do is quickly, and and uh, you know now that we're in uh, TV land. Normally, I, I kind of encourage a very interactive uh, uh, type of discussion where I say, well, ask me questions, because there's a lot I'm not saying. But of course, everyone's out there in TV land. But feel free to interrupt me. Um, so first of all, you know, what does NASA do as an agency? Well, we're required to put this up whenever we give a talk. Uh, Ilya, you don't know that yet, so you'll need to. No, not officially, but they encourage it. Um, NASA's really been trying to focus on what its mission is, OK, and really crisply define it. And so it's been pushing that we're really about uh, to improve life here, to extend life beyond, and to find uh, to extend life to there and to find life beyond. And one thing that I want to note um, on the bottom in terms of our mission is to inspire the next generation of explorers. It's something that we were talking today about the work that ELA has been doing, where that's really seen as a critical aspect of NASA's vision of um, uh, inspiring young kids uh, to go into math, science, uh, engineering, um, and technology. Um, so as many of you all know, there's a new, uh, the official name is uh, the Nation's, the Nation's Space Exploration Vision. I've been told that's the right phrase. It's not the President's, it's the Nation's. Um, but uh, it is an exciting time, because basically, and I was involved actually in a lot of the uh, strategy, um, the assessment was made that um, uh, as an agency, uh, for a long time, NASA has been stuck in low Earth orbit. So for the last uh, three or four years, there's been an activity going and saying, you know, what is NASA going to do outside going beyond uh, LEO? And that ultimately, we are about space exploration. And the one thing that um, uh, before this meeting, the interesting thing was there used to be this, this uh, bifurcation within NASA. There was the robotic side and the human side. And never the twain shall meet. Okay, so in fact, he used to talk to the human side, and their attitude was, well, uh, yeah, maybe we'll use a robot to help us, but probably not. You know, humans can do everything. And, and uh, what I considered was the uh, uh, big conquests over the last few years, with all the people on the human exploration side, it all was just generally agreed upon that when we send humans back to the moon and Mars, they're going to go with robotic assistance and that they need to be intelligent and they need to be smart and they need to aid them because we're going there to do something, not just flags and footprints. Okay, so a big part of the new vision is saying, um, look, NASA has to figure out a way that it can have a sustainable vision um, uh, that can kind of a slow march towards progress because you get into this problem where you don't want to get stuck in one place. So as many of y'all probably know, the vision decided that uh, the moon is the next target, but the moon is really seen as a stepping stone to Mars. 
And one of the interesting things about the lunar exploration, um, uh, some of the discussions, actually NASA initially was kind of saying, let's just go straight for, um, uh, uh, let's go, just go straight for Mars. But after analysis, it was sort of determined that that wasn't necessarily a sustainable strategy uh, in terms of building public support, in terms of demonstrating technologies. And so right now, the moon is really seen as a test bed um, to understand not just to do science on the moon, but also to understand how we would explore um, the uh, uh, Mars eventually. Um, so there are a lot of challenges when we go to lunar exploration, such as, as I said, um, increased um, what, what are, uh, uh, autonomous systems so that it can be centered on what are called crew prime, where the crew is really driving it as opposed to mission control. And it offers a lot of interesting challenges um, technically. So um, this is showing you, of course, as we talk about going back to the moon, uh, back to Mars with humans. Um, today, a lot of times we kind of take robotics you know, uh, for granted. Sure, you got robots everywhere, right? We've got them up on Mars. Well, of course, we've sent three robots to Mars. And if we were talking five months ago, it would have been only one mobile robot ever moved around Mars. And our coverage of that surface is woefully small. Okay, so here are the two dots we've been. Um, uh, today we're greatly limited by where we could go. Um, but ultimately, um, the exploration of Mars, uh, I see as one of those things, much like um, uh, uh, Galileo's discoveries and Darwin, that could really change the very way we view ourselves in this world. Uh, you know, the discovery of standing water on there now further suggests that uh, this is the best, one of the most likely places in the solar system to determine if life happened to begin somewhere else. And a lot of people kind of say, well, if we go to Mars and found there was life there, well, why do we ever need to send humans? Well, uh, uh, really the game's just beginning then. Because if you do find evidence that at some point there was life on Mars, of course the next question is, is it different than life on Earth? Did they come from separate uh, origins? And if they did, that's at least in my mind, ultimately guaranteeing that there is some other intelligent life in the universe. Because if out of two out of two places that we know in the solar system where the conditions were right at some point for right for life to begin, then now when, since we have billions upon billions upon billions about other habitable planets, um, that tells you something about our place in the solar system. And I really feel like we're at a place where um, uh, we may have within our lifetime able to start answering some of these questions. So here's a picture y'all might not have seen. Uh, we're kind of keeping it real quiet. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of rioting there about the rovers, very upset about the presence, but um, uh, this one hasn't hit the news. Um, uh, so a lot of questions of why are we going to, to Mars, and it's really blending um, using a phrase what I'll call exploration science. Okay, so. Um, there are really kind of three things. One is classical science, where you have a hypothesis and you want to answer that hypothesis. Okay? The problem with the way we do discovery is often you don't know what you're looking for. Okay? And so, in fact, in the, a, a lot of what we're doing is what you'll call discovery. We don't know what we're looking for. We don't have an exact hypothesis that we're trying to validate. In fact, we're going and getting information and creating those hypotheses as we, as we, um, uh, as we explore. And a big part of it is also just the um, uh, applied science about understanding humans beyond their planet of origin. Okay, now I'm going to get into the technology. So the first talk was I had to talk a little bit about humans exploring Mars. And now I'm going to get into some of the stuff that have been going on at Ames, uh, where while it has not been a primary focus of NASA's vision. At Ames, um, we've been doing a lot of research in this area to um, try and explore some of the information technology challenges. Um, this is showing, giving you a sense of kind of what I see Ames is about. Um, this is showing this kind of cycle of applied engineering and technology. And really, what we try to do is work along all paths of this cycle. So ultimately, there's some set of missions we want to do in 10, 15 years to identify some key challenges, work with the broader community, make some fundamental advances, and then ultimately transition the technology into missions. And a lot of what Ames has been doing is both um, uh, fundamental research, but also trying to have an impact on NASA uh, today. So we'll talk about some of that. Um, this is some of the various needs. Let me, um, let me see. Hold on a second. Is this? No, I don't talk about the, I, I hid that slide. Um, so at NASA Ames, just to give you a sense of Ames, Ames has a his, historically was a center of aerodynamic research, wind tunnels, 
Uh, to anyone who's been in the Bay Area, they're driving on 101, they see Moffett Field, and they see these humongoloid wind tunnels. Uh, well, that's sort of the Ames of yesteryear. Um, Ames, over the last 15 years, has really sort of reinvented itself. The focus of Ames as a research center is really information technology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology. Um, in information technology, which is um, almost a third of the direct work that is done at Ames, there's a very diverse range of work. So it ranges from robotics, autonomy, smart spacecraft, smart systems, intelligent systems, human-centered systems. I'm going to talk about that a fair amount. Um, high end computing and modeling has been a strength there for some time uh, for Earth climate modeling. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, Great computing uh, is a big challenge for NASA. Um, human factors, we have a long history of understanding how human and machines um, operate together for the aeronautics sector. Uh, dependable software uh, is a big challenge for NASA. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, intelligent data understanding for science, data understanding are just some of the things that we do there. Um, overall, in the directorate, there are about 750 researchers, both basic and applied. So it's a rather diverse um, set of activities. Um, so the essence of NASA, ultimately, is the effective team between humans and machines to achieve some type of challenging goal. So here we see the space shuttle. Uh, we see mission control. We see the building of things. Even when we do robotic exploration of Mars, ultimately there are 240 scientists and engineers on the ground. And it's really about teamwork. And so a lot of the thrust recently has been in the area of human-centered systems about trying to say, let me get this animated, um, what are some key design principles uh, uh, by which you can build technology to allow the, te the, the technology to come to the humans as opposed to vice versa? I think this is something that is very true within what Microsoft has to do. You know, so a lot of technology pitfalls is build it and they will come. Um, uh, well, let's just ask them what they want. A lot of times people don't understand their work practice as opposed to process. So in fact, if you look over here when I talk about people and culture, um, what we've been doing a lot is going in is watching people in how they work. Okay? You have to talk to them and understand how they think about their job, but office their practice is different from the process by which they actually believe they're doing. And to explicitly model the types of interactions between people. Okay, and this is, so in human-centered systems, there are kind of key design principles that use design as a cooperative action between the end customer and the designer, okay? Uh, that often there's mutual learning between the users and designers. Uh, as I said, uh, observe how users practice, not just the process. Um, give you a sense of what that means. Um, uh, for the Mars Exploration Rover, uh, about two years ago, uh, we had a group that decided we were going to go in and watch the scientists doing field tests. So we went in, what happens is they do field tests with rovers out in the desert, and they had a bunch of scientists in a room. Um, so in this room, they were using flip charts. So uh, uh, that's what we see. I should have a pointer there. But um, they scribbled all over on flip charts. Uh, they all had different laptops. Of course, they did not interoperate. Um, they all, the, the information was really distributed across the team. They would take printouts like of pictures, circle them, and draw notes. And then when they would do a shift handover, because, you know, Mars, you'd have people working one eight-hour shift, another people another eight-hour shift. Um, often a lot of the information was lost. Why they were doing certain observations, the context, okay? So in watching them, these are some of the flip charts that they would draw up. Um, what we did was, uh, we then decided to build a large interactive display uh, that, would, that was customized to meet the way in which they were operating. So this is uh, a, a lot of the software. This was custom designed software where we built upon open source and other standards. So what you're seeing, uh, Jay Trimble was the one who designed this. Uh, it actually was drawn off of some of the work IBM has done in the blue board. The idea was you have a large appliance that's in the middle of the room for collaboration. Uh, you can walk up. Uh, it's all client server, so you walk up, tap your, um, uh, your picture, you get into your workspace. You can be sitting on your laptop working in your workspace. Okay? Uh, in there, uh, it's designed very easily so that people can uh, take pictures, save them, draw on them, drag them over. Um, uh, they have a number of customized tools for managing the activities that they're going to be doing. None of the actual applications that are running on there are rocket science. You know, all this stuff is stuff, you know, in fact, actually one of the areas where I think there's some very interesting synergies um, is in the, this was before y'all had gotten the tablet 
uh, when we started developing this. I think there are huge opportunities in terms of the tablet PC and the interaction in terms of the modality. Because scientists like to write and draw and scribble. And so, if you will, this was using a large tablet PC on the desktop, though. Uh, the app is not customized for the tablet PC. Um, but so it created a collaborative workspace um, that, uh, uh, that the scientists could go up and use, start scribbling on. Uh, what we found was, and this was sort of a, a testament to the value of the work, um, was six months after we started building software, they had another field campaign. And we had these large flat, plane, flat panel displays with the software running. And we hadn't given any of the scientists any training. Okay, uh, if you'll notice, the picture on the right is that scribble board that was all covered before. Okay, and what this is saying to me was that if you use a systematic process of understanding what really people need, okay, then you can develop quickly an application that meets their needs and that they will use freely. Okay, we didn't have the luxury. This wasn't something that they were required to use. We couldn't send them through lots of training. We had to get a user interface design that was very intuitive and very natural for them. Um, if you see pictures of, of the MER mission, you'll see these all over the control rooms. They've been a very big hit. Um, they use them on all of them, all the missions. They, can, uh, 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 they have the ability to mirror each other. You can use VNC. Again, a lot of it's just kind of standard concepts, but it's really the integration that was challenging. Um, and so I use that to give an example of kind of human-centered systems and why we observe people in their work practice. Now I'm going to talk some about some field tests that uh, Bill Clancy has been leading uh, in a mobile agents process, a project. And the idea here is to understand how humans are going to partner with robots and what type of information system needs to support them for field science campaigns. Okay? Um, so this, let's see if the... This is actually um, from Apollo. Uh, uh, it's uh, Bob Serhan talking. You can't really tell it while I'm talking. But what's happening is the astronaut, that's Bob Serhan, that's, that's in the suit, he is communicating all the way back to Earth to find out where an extra bag is. And he communicates back to Earth. Earth communicates to the astronaut that's in the lander. The astronaut in the lander communicates back to Earth to tell him that he left a bag in um, uh, uh, under the seat in the car in the in the rover buggy. Okay, so so what this is saying? So there are two people that are just right close to each other, but the way they're communicating is with people back on Earth. Okay, and the way we explored in Apollo was this tight coupling where Capcom controlled everything they did. Okay, and that model of exploring, first of all, it requires an army of ground controllers, but it breaks down. Obviously, it doesn't work as soon as you go to Mars. Okay, um, uh, and it really takes a completely different way of thinking about exploration for NASA. Um, what this is showing right here, so it starts first. There's a tool called BROMS. It's basically an agent modeling framework uh, that had been developed uh, uh, at Ames and previously where Bill was before, and initially it was designed to model humans and systems interacting together uh, to see how the overall system evolved over time and what type of interactions occurred. So if you will, there's been a lot of work in task networks to talk about static interactions. This is taking a task network and simulating it over time. So you model the people, you model the different software agents, the different um, um, uh, computers that they might use. You have uh, uh, explicit behavior-based models of how each of them perform. And then you can simulate it over time and realize where there are mismatches, where I might send you a message, but you might be sleeping at that time because you're on a different time uh, scale than I am. Um, so initially, this was just used. In fact, we used this for some of the MER to simulate the ground controllers. Um, then what we've done is, and actually let me how this is going on. Uh, I probably didn't time this perfectly. What you're seeing right here is actually the integrated agent-based system. And this is out in the field campaign. So one of the astronauts is talking to, uh, using a natural language system. Uh, he's got an agent uh, running on his backpack. Let me do you want to download all the images on your camera? Yes. Finished recording voice note. Create sample back one. 
Let me hit it now. So what you were just seeing there, and in fact, um, if you look in the upper hand, right hand corner, uh, basically each astronaut, they have a number of sensors on them, a digital camera, video camera, GPS receiver, handheld instrument. That's all integrated together, and each astronaut has a personal agent, okay, and it's a Brahms agent. And this agent has a model of what that astronaut is going to be doing, okay? One of the interesting things here, for years AI has been looking at solving the common sense reasoning problem. What we found, as many people have realized, is that when you have context, often that is at the heart of the common sense reasoning problem. Well, within NASA, often you have a restricted environment where you can place the context around what the astronaut is doing. So then when the astronaut is using a natural language dialogue system, there's a restricted vocabulary that they'd be using, a restricted gra grammar, and actually you can get into intelligent discourse uh, uh, with, the, with the agent that can tell you things. So for example, you take a picture and you name the site of where you took the picture. Okay, since it knows that you're out doing a science campaign, it knows to take that picture and file it under that name. Okay, then later on, you can refer to that name back in the location that you were. And it has the context within the model to understand uh, that you're talking about the location you're at before. So the GPS receiver automatically transparent to the user records the GPS location as he names a location, okay? Um, there also is, so on the right, you'll notice that it's various modalities. They actually have a, a, a notepad that they can um, scratch uh, uh, drawings or other things. They have speech input. Um, they also have an ATV that's a robotic assistant that is, uh, uh, that is moving around, and that also has a Brahms agent running, all interacting together so that it can ask the robot to come over here it knows where here is because it's got the GPS receiver to identify that location, okay? The point of doing this is really in part, and this is identifying actually some of the uh, types of communication, that the astronauts, uh, the HAPCOM, uh, they communicate via radio, but for voice they talk with their personal agents, and then there's the external systems on the right. Um, let me see. So some of the functionality, so location tracking. So GPS is mounted on backpacks and ATVs, a flexible logging interval. Um, uh, good question. Are you planning to drive by man um, You talked about off-world, so, so what's with the GPS then? Oh, well, for, for this particular case, um, we were using GPS because the localization is itself an exception. Honest, when we send when we do human exploration of Mars, we would probably put GPS satellites around there. Although there's a lot of exactly. So there's a lot of work in um, uh, uh, pseudo satellites where you can get some localized GPS as well. So it was saying we don't want to do research in finding some way to do GPS on Mars, you know, for this particular experiment because the expectation is. Um, uh, localization is something that is maturing independently. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, let me, let me move. So, the overall idea of this project is not just to develop the overall intelligent agent framework, but also to understand where it works and where it breaks down. One of the interesting things they found out of a use of a robot was they had a lot of problem of maintaining the comm link as they were moving. And so, in fact, one of the things they use the robot for is just as a mobile comm link. So that as they're moving, it moves, and it can keep track of whether or not the comm link is active, and it positions itself to make sure you have a continual comm link with the hat. Okay? Those are the types of things that initially you'd never think that you'd use a robot for. And so some of this idea is understanding how humans are going to work and what type of roles that they perform well, what type of roles automated systems perform well. Um, one of the technologies that was in demonstration there was a, uh, a spoken dialogue system that actually Bob would know a great deal about because he brought a lot of the group um, that uh, started developing the realist system at, uh, um, at NASA Ames. Um, and they recently have gotten a, a very successful deployment where it's actually going to be flying on space station in, um, in September of this year, hopefully. And basically it's a dialogue manager, so it works with, again, as I said, a restricted grammar. Um, and they've actually worked where now you can have an open mic so you can just continually talk as I'm doing since it works with a restrictive grammar then when you're actually talking within the context of the action it can disambiguate between the, uh, um, uh, the utterances that you're saying 
Um, what it's going to be used for is uh, when astronauts are on the station, a lot of times they have these complex procedures. And often you have to have one astronaut that's looking at a procedure, reading it, while another astronaut is doing it. Okay, and astronaut time is, of course, very valuable. So it's providing basically, it's really kind of a simple application, an intelligent procedure system where they can sit there, be doing the procedure, and they can be talking to the procedure back end, and it'll be telling it the next you know, procedure to take. And you can say, no, skip ahead. No, I've already done that. What about this section? Okay, and it's, it's, it's really not rocket science. I, 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 in fact, I should have probably mentioned this at the beginning. Um, a lot of the theme of a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about here, it's not so much that, and, and this is, I do say this in the last chart, um, ultimately when you look at AI, um, a lot of times the really jazzy things is the sexy algorithm or the sexy piece, and, and really ultimately uh, uh, the real challenge is the integration of it all into a system that works together. And ultimately I feel like that is the big challenge for AI now, that AI is in lots of pieces all over the place, but really, how does the overall system work? And so a lot of it is an engineering challenge to bring it all together. Um, this is something we've been developing. In fact, let me get the movie going. Um, called the Personal Satellite Assistant. Um, and it's a small robotic orb. It actually was uh, motivated uh, uh, from a flight experiment that was done on the station where the astronauts had PDAs. And what they'd do is they'd hang them in the air, and then they'd go and do something, and then they'd grab their PDA. Okay, and the idea was, well, what if you had a mobile PDA? Okay, so the idea was to develop a mobile device that could move around within the station. Uh, in fact, it's all voice controlled. It's got a little screen there so that you can get uh, situational awareness. It's got a camera. So if a scientist is on the ground and they want to get a view of an experiment that's going on, they can send the PSA over there. It can be looking at the experiment. Um, a lot of times the astronaut uh, uh, may not want to go, for example, early on when they had a, uh, a gas leak in the station. Um, it could roam around at night as sort of a night sentinel, okay, and check pressure and find and do triangulation to determine if there's a pressure gradient and try to localize where a leak might be. Um, another of the ideas of the uses is um, uh, uh, inventory tracking. That's a big problem on the station. They have all this stuff, and they often don't know where it is. And so one of the ideas is you can put RFID tags on the stuff. This thing can fly around at night, keep track of where everything is, okay? And then when you're about to go do something, it can tell you if everything's there. Um, a lot of times the, the idea of this, people say, oh, but are we ever going to fly one of these on the space station? Is this? The way I look at this is it actually is a very interesting research platform uh, that looks at the synergies between a mobile agent and immobile software agents. So in fact, ultimately, as you're talking to this, uh, to a PSA, you might say, what is the temperature on the flight deck? Now, the PSA, and you could have two or three of them in the station, might need to deploy a PSA to go find out, or there might be a stationary sensor that can tell you that information, okay? The, the decision of when you need mobility and when you would use a software agent to make inference, and when your software agent then might need additional information, so it would task them a mobile agent to go get additional information. So for example, with the idea of a night sentinel that might build an environmental model of the station, what you might do is in the normal traversing, you can build a partial environmental model. And then if you have questions about different areas, you, as a PSA is moving through the station, it can divert its path to find other regions that have not been pursued. Okay. One of the big challenges in this is a robust operation in a 3D environment. So the 3D localization has been a big challenge. Um, we actually have a lab at Ames that has a simulated zero-G environment within three dimensions. So in fact, it has a crane that, and it's a ductive fan system. So it's actually pretty cool when it's, uh, uh, when it's operating. So it's, and we have a mock-up of the station. So in fact, the PSA can move around. It does vision-based localization and navigation. Um, and since it's a, zero, a simulated zero-G environment, you get a tiny bit of thrust with this crane, and the crane propels that thrust all the way through space. Um, so it's the type of thing that it's an interesting artifact for looking at the interplay between um, embodied and unembodied agent and the overall problem of agent architectures, and it's also very engaging to the general public. Furthermore, it's the type of thing that while you may or may not use it within the station, 
a similar platform called the um, uh, AirCam is something that's often considered to use external to the station. And so it's the type of thing that as we start talking about uh, on over construction and other thing astronauts might do, um, astronauts can learn to work in partnership with a robot uh, within the station so that as we start understanding how they may interoperate. Um, so here's a project that uh, uh, has been going on for a few years um, uh, that is looking at how to detect subtle perturbations in EEG and EMG um, uh, uh, signals. Okay, so it's using machine learning algorithms to interpret and classify the signals. We started out, we were one of the first places who did sort of a virtual keyboard, which a lot of people are sort of familiar with now. Um, actually, then they went on to what you see in the top corner is uh, a virtual joystick landing uh, flying an F-15. Um, but in the bottom right-hand corner is something that uh, they just recently had a big accomplishment. It's looking at subvocal speech detection. Okay, so um, uh, when you think of a word, your vocal cords vibrate. Okay, um, and so in fact, as you see, this is Chuck Jorgensen sitting there. The signal is as he's thinking of a word. Okay, and you can see there are just four sensors there. They're actually working with a company to put these sensors in a shirt so that they can be non-contact sensors. Okay, so far they've been able to show to decipher, I think, about 20 words. Um, uh, so they've actually controlled a robot moving uh, moving around. Uh, they've also done a virtual web browser where they where he thinks of letters so he can spell things out. Now ultimately, the big problem now is the segmentation. So right now it's basically doing classification on 20 words. Okay, there's a pause between the words so that he can get the signal. It can do the classification on one of 20 words. He's tried a number of different machine learning algorithms. Um, uh, uh, to get one that works appropriately. But the next step is really doing the segmentation um, of the different utterances so that then if you can actually determine that segmentation, then you can get into leveraging off of the natural language uh, work that's been going on. From a NASA perspective, um, uh, interestingly enough, I actually initially was thinking this was a really cool thing, but I always doubted why NASA needed to do it, to be honest. Um, but recently there's been some evidence to suggest that um, the environment uh, within certain space, uh, uh, the, the space station in certain cases is very noisy and very difficult to operate in and that in fact uh, uh, the, the claim there was a lot of interest because they feel like um, when you combine this with other clues, so for example you have a standard speech detection along with the subvocal detection that and along with multimodal interaction that it's one of a number of different clues of what someone might be saying. Um, now I'm going to jump into something, uh, uh, the broad area of autonomy. Um, so obviously this is a, actually I actually have one chart that says autonomy and this big word comes out because it's a big word. What do we mean by autonomy? Well first of all we don't mean autonomy. Uh, uh, when we build smart systems we don't want them to go off and just do whatever they want. As I always say, how is the perfect example of uh, uh, what NASA doesn't want. And when you talk about a human-centered system, it's not human-centered at all. So when we start building systems, uh, it's really talking about making decisions as agents for the human. Um, of course, NASA has some huge challenges in that in terms of a continual virtual presence uh, with limited communication uh, delay and other things. Um, so about three or four years ago, uh, uh, NASA Ames, in partnership with JPL, uh, flew the remote agent experiment. I'm not going to uh, go into detail here. It was uh, three years ago. Any speech by someone from NASA had to talk about the remote agent for 10 minutes. So luckily we're past that. Um, but it was a significant accomplishment. And in fact, I, I, uh, um, it was kind of one of the first AI systems to fly on a spacecraft. Uh, basically, you would send up a high-level goal. The planning system would then plan out a week's worth of activities. So it had a high-level planning and scheduling system had a reactive execution system and it had a model based reasoning system to do um, the health management and diagnosis. Uh, what I really found it as um, uh, was really an engineering accomplishment. Once again, the big challenge wasn't in the individual technologies. It was putting them all together so that they worked as a system and really met the needs of the system engineer. And in doing that, that's where you've learned where so many of these problems um, break down. Um, so I'm not going to go into model-based programming. I think folks here uh, uh, know enough about that. Um, what I am going to talk about here is some stats, some other stuff we've done in terms of robotic exploration of Mars. So uh, you see actually Sojourner up there. 
and some interesting facts for Sojourner is uh, uh, the max distance from the lander that it ever got was 12 meters. Uh, total distance travel was 100 meters over 87 days. Uh, time spent waiting was 40 to 75 percent of the time. It was twiddling its thumbs. Um, uh, the when it eventually we lost it, it's because of the battery on the lander, because uh, of the thermal cycling of the battery. And so we could have gotten a lot more science out of the rover. Okay, but. We just basically, whenever something went wrong, the rover would just sit there and wait for us to figure it out. Okay. Now, I'd like to say MERS is a lot better. Well, uh, it isn't in terms of the onboard decision making. Um, uh, so one quote from the PI was, it takes the MER rover a day to do what a field geologist can do in about 45 seconds. Uh, and a lot of the big human exploration folks have been um, uh, uh, saying that a, uh, you know, a field geologist could have done what MER has done in about two hours. I don't know if that's quite true. But um, overall, MER has about 240 co-located scientists and engineers on the ground. Um, uh, and so it's a large investment in people and time uh, with limited ability to make decisions on board. In 2009, we're sending up a nuclear-powered rover with an RTG. Um, that's going to last for on the order of two Martian years for about 600 days. So this model of having 240 people co-located at JPL for 90 days doesn't work anymore. Um, the other thing that breaks down is currently they've been operating, uh, they've just switched over in the extended mission to start operating on Earth time. They had been operating on Mars time, um, which is about 39 minutes longer than Earth time. So every day they got up 39 minutes later. Uh, that leads to a lot of stress. In fact, some of the work we did, we have a lot of our fatigue experts go down there and observe the circadian rhythms and how that impacted stress and interpersonal relationships. Um, so when we go to this 2009 mission, we're going to have people spread across the country, yet there's so much context from the joint interaction within one room that how they're going to command a rover and decide what to do is a real big challenge. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of the MER mission. I think you'll probably know a lot about that. Um, so one of the technologies that we infused onto MER, um, in fact, uh, it's sort of a model that we've used on a few other cases about infusing technology. When, when MER got planned, initially the technology program focused on it said, well, it's too soon. We can't do any technology. Okay? Uh, uh, put, put it off till later. So we went in there and said, that doesn't make sense to us. Uh, we had a lower TRA, uh, I'm sorry, you don't know NASA speak, a more basic research program that we felt like um, uh, it was a great opportunity to actually take technology, infuse it so it enhanced the mission, and that's where we would really gain a deep understanding of the real problems as opposed to more of an academic understanding. Um, so in fact, one of the things we infused was some planning and scheduling technology that had flown on remote agent uh, for the ground, basically, and the scientists used this, where normally the scientists um, there's the engineering constraints, what you want to do from a science perspective. Um, there are all these tasks, there are all these flight rules, that's that mesh at the end. Ultimately, what the scientist is often doing is sitting there trying to think through all of the uh, uh, mechanics of the rover and constraints to figure out what he can do. And what you want the scientist to be doing is thinking about the science and not about the engineering constraints. Okay? So this is kind of showing, let me. So, for example, this is a simple example, touch and go approach solve. So this is where you go, you do a, uh, I think this one is a MOS power a spectrometer, then you drive, and then you do some more science. So to do that, um, this is uh, a number of the instruments on there. There are a lot of more detailed things that you need to do. Okay, and so on the right there, you'll, or your left, there's science constraints. Uh, where you'd say, well, this is going to take an hour, and do this before that, and something must follow that. Okay, so the uh, and a lot of these are temporal constraints. There are flight rules that you cannot violate. Okay, um, uh, this is the drive uh, in terms of the different activities. Um, basically, what the system did was it. I mean, we're familiar with planning and scheduling. Nothing magical here, um, uh, but it was using um, uh, one of the concepts developed on remote agent, which is leveraging temporal flexibility. Uh, so it would, as opposed to generating a single plan, it would generate a representation of a space of plans because you talk about events and activities, and you'd have the temporal constraints explicitly representing when some have to be before and after. And the nice thing about this is we focused on a mixed initiative system where the scientists could actually move things around 
and the constraints would automatically be applied. So in fact, he could grab something and move it later, and as soon as he got to where he violated that constraint, now he couldn't move it anymore, okay? Because the scientists wanted to have direct control of this. And so this was another example where we watched what they needed, and they needed, they didn't want a system that you just tell it something and then it goes off in plans. It needed a more interactive system. Um, so looking to the future, um, uh, for the 2009 mission, now we're looking to transition uh, some more onboard decision making in terms of uh, robust execution. Um, and one of the ideas that we've been pursuing is this idea of a contingent activity plan. So scientists like to be able to tell the rover what to do. They don't like to have the rover go and decide what it's going to do. And so the idea is that you generate a sequence Okay, and then you generate a number of contingent branches. Okay, so in fact, this is kind of showing uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the temporal execution about the duration of drives, the power utilization, the energy collected by solar panels, ability to reach a desired point. And what you do there is you basically use a utility model to look at the probability of the failure of a plan, and then you take the utility of each of the branches, and you try to get some optimal uh, set of alternative branches based upon an overall utility model so that you can, with a small number of sequences that you generate on the ground, there's a high probability that one of them will be able to execute all the way through. The advantage of this is you're focusing a lot of your computation on the ground and you can fully validate all of the paths through this sequence. Okay, because one of the things that's really important is the ground controllers want to know for sure that um, uh, uh, that it's not going to do something bad, okay? Um, looking at the time. Oh. You know, we'll we'll uh, put the mute on for that. Um, this is some work we've been doing in terms of single cycle um, uh, instrument placement. Let me look at the time. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to jump through this. Um, so here's a project that actually was a big part of the MER mission as well uh, that actually builds a 3D stereographic map um, of this is actually the Pathfinder landing site that you're flying through right now. And so uh, uh, this is an example where building a 3D map isn't all that uh, uh, incredible. Uh, there's actually a, some ongoing research. I think the, the data set from the MER mission is actually a wonderful data set. In fact, I'm working now to try and get it more broadly available. Um, uh, what the scientists would have loved is to be able to have a virtual camera on the rover. So for Pathfinder, they had a lander, and the lander could always watch the rover. Okay, but for MER, we don't have a camera where we can't see the rover. Okay, now what this was doing was it was building a 3D map from one stationary location. Okay, so of course there's been a lot of work on simultaneous localization and mapping. And the data set that we have for MER, if you look at the, all of the images that we have, along with the telemetry uh, in terms of the um, navigation. It's a great opportunity to build a 3D virtual world of the actual MER mission. Okay, and you can take a picture of the rover, you can place it in there, because for 2009 what you'd like is if you don't know about a path, you can move your camera down underneath the uh, uh, rover. Not something that, I mean, it's something with a lot of challenges, but it's actually a wonderful data set uh, to explore and to demonstrate it. Um, so this project is, um, uh, is, it was motivated when um, an F-15 crashed, and well, it, I'm sorry, it didn't crash. Part of the wing broke off of an F-15, um, but the pilot was still able to land it. Actually, the pilot was told to eject. He didn't listen, and he landed the plane. He was demoted for not listening, and then he was promoted for landing the plane effectively. Okay. In simulation, they tried it in 99 out of 100 times the pilots could not land this plane. Somehow this pilot had figured out what remaining control surfaces existed so that he could still land the plane safely. Okay, So uh, these are actually some of the same folks who did the extension human senses work earlier. Um, what they did was they developed a neural net algorithm that within a sixth of a second, giving a change to your aerodynamic properties, it relearns the control algorithm so that the pilot can just continually fly the plane as if nothing went wrong and it translates the control actions into the appropriate control 
uh, for the remaining control surfaces. Actually, in a couple months, we're going to be flying this on a uh, modified F-15, which has these canards that they can switch over to radically change the aerodynamic properties. It's been demonstrated extensively in simulation, but now will be demonstrated actually um, in flight. Um, so uh, this project uh, is, and I, I do it because it's a great picture and it's a good example of uh, 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 genetic algorithms. Basically, uh, 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 one of our researchers has been doing work in coevolution of genetic algorithms, uh, where you're, um, um, uh, and in this particular case where he's been using it is in antenna design. Um, and so what you're seeing there is actually an antenna that's going to fly on a mission that's going to launch in about a year. And the actual, this is going to be a backup antenna. The main antenna is just this straight spoke that they actually had customized maze at, uh, I think it was University of New Mexico, because for the, it's a nano satellite, so the satellite's about this big. So it took them about three weeks to, using genetic algorithms, to design that antenna, and it outperforms the antenna that was built by the human expert, the world's top antenna designer. I was going to say, I make that daily in my office. I know. <laughs> and the interesting thing about this, they actually, they changed the orbit of the spacecraft, and it took him about two weeks to design a new antenna. So he, he sent an email saying, uh-oh, there's bad news. They changed the orbit of the spacecraft, and this antenna isn't going to work. The good news is, it only took us a couple weeks to design another one. Okay? Now, I mention this because it actually... It identifies an area where you have a very large unstructured space. Um, uh, another, some other work that he's done actually is where he's designed an antenna for the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, where the antenna used all the metal that was already in the spacecraft. Because so often the way designers build things is you break things into subsystems, and then you kind of wall yourself off from the other subsystem, because it's too complex to take that into account when you're doing the design. So, but using his genetic algorithm, he was able to design an antenna that leveraged the rest of the metal that was in the spacecraft to get significant increase gain. Okay, and it's an example of as we start building uh, a much more coupled system, the whole process of designing systems, we're going to move away from a more traditional approach where you can decouple a system into non-interacting subsystems. And now you're really, especially as you start talking about the advent of nanotechnology, you're getting to where you have much more coupling within your system. And that really challenges us from a design perspective. Um, let me see. I'm trying to remember. I, I, some of these charts I put in last night, so I'm trying to remember when we're getting at the end. Um, a recent thrust that we've had that I think, in fact, there's some interaction with some of y'all's researchers, um, uh, the whole problem of software dependability. This chart is showing the percentage of functionality in software for fighter planes. And you can see uh, that 80 percent of the functionality in some way depends upon a, a software in an F-22. Okay. For NASA, this is a huge problem in terms of the dependability of the software. And uh, uh, we've started something with Carnegie Mellon. Uh, in the high, it's called the High Dependability Computing Program. And the idea is to, to bring together um, uh, empirical researchers with software engineering technologists into realistic test beds. So, in fact, we've done some work in building some large rover test beds um, where we can bring together folks like Barry Bean and Vic Basile and other folks who do empirical research. They can be evaluating um, different the, what they want to do is identify those attributes that you can measure early on in the software development process that end up being predictive of the dependability of the software once it's in use. Okay? And then what you want to do is measure what technologies and interventions can help improve the dependability. Okay? So for NASA, this is really a huge problem. Uh, for shuttle and station, uh, you can't upgrade the software because it's too risky. So on the space shuttle, they don't allow anyone to touch the software, yet we've been operating it for 20 years. So as we start talking about future exploration, um, uh, it, uh, it depends critically upon being able to upgrade the software. What I'm going to do now, let's go to conclusions. So um, what I tried to do here was just show a broad range of some of the things that are going on at, uh, um, within NASA in the whole area of um, artificial intelligence and human-centered systems. Um, uh, going back to the point I made before, uh, for NASA, the real challenge is not focusing on individual algorithms, but really understanding how you can put together 
an architecture where the intelligence is really emergent. And often each individual piece is not so fancy schmancy, uh, but it's the overall behavior of the integrated system. And how do you define a more systematic process to build these systems? So with that, the end. I, I know I jumped through a lot of things, and none of them did I get to sufficient depth, but uh, I had to make that choice.